All right, so uh, next Tuesday, I got to skip town. Uh, so it'll be a, a pre-recorded lecture that I'll, I'll post on YouTube, and I'll post a, a remind everyone on Piazza. So don't, next Tuesday, uh, there'll be no in-class lecture. Yes? Is the midterm Thursday? Sorry. Yeah, so I've only taught Mondays and Wednesdays for the last nine years at Carnegie Mellon. This is the first time I've ever taught Tuesdays to Thursdays, so my mind is all messed up. So I keep, that's always a typo. Yes. It's October 13th, but it's a Thursday. Yes, thank you. I, and I made the same, same mistake on Piazza. Uh, so anyway, the Tuesday, next class on Tuesday, that'll be, um, that'll be a remote lecture, so don't come here. Homework three will be due this coming Sunday. The midterm exam will be Thursday, October 13th, uh, and that'll be here at the regular class time. Uh, and I post on Piazza the midterm study guide. Uh, you should be able to download the, the PDFs for the, the, the practice exams on, uh, if you're on campus Wi-Fi or VPN. Uh, post on Slack or, or post on Piazza if you can't. I updated the Wi-Fi lists or the IP addresses that are allowed. Um, if it doesn't work again, message B. And then, oh God, it's that's Project Two, not Project Three. Project Two is out now. Checkpoint One will be uh, due next Tuesday, the 11th. Um, and then Checkpoint Two will be due on Sunday, October 23rd. So we'll have an info session for uh, for, for this Thursday, which is what today's the fourth or fifth whatever two days from now on thursday at, at 8 p.m i'll post on piazza it'll be on zoom again and then record record it we'll make it available on box and the slides will be available as well yes is the tuesday lecture next week in scope for the midterm no the question is is, is this tuesday's lecture in scope of the midterm no the midterm will include uh this lecture thursday's lecture inclusive but not next week it'd be kind of it'd be kind of sh thing for me to do like like i taught this thing on tuesday now i ask you questions on thursday yes What do you mean by released? Like the phone grade bill. Oh, uh, we'll, try to do that. we'll try to get that done this week. Yes. So the question is, when will, when will the, grade, the, grading, uh, the grading submission for Checkpoint 2 be released on Gradescope? We'll get that done this week. I think it's done. We just have to post it. Yes. The question is, is Checkpoint 2 is due during the fall, fall break? Will the office hours during fall break? Yes. You have a question? Okay. Yes. Are we supposed to work on the project still uh, in the fall break? The question is how are you supposed to work on the, pro the project during the fall break? Uh, I mean, it's... <laughs> Charlie, what's the university policy for that? <laughs> Is it really supposed to do nothing? I think it's supposed to be a break. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take this offline. We'll figure this out. Uh, yes. You still can't access it on campus. Wi -Fi. All right, well, I'll, I will fix this. Yes. Well, I'll just post the PD PDFs on Piazza. Thank you. Anything else? The slides should be today. It should be project two. Yes, there's a lot of mistakes on this line. I will fix this. <laughs> this is the last thing I did before I came over. Like, oh, yeah, I, gotta, I should update this. Sorry. Doesn't really instill confidence that everything else is correct, but tr if I'm getting dates wrong, that's, that's, I'm okay with that. Okay? All right, so let, let's jump into this. So today we're going to talk about joints. As I said, joints are the, 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 the bedrock operator we could have in relational algebra that's going to be commonly used in, in queries, and we want to make sure that we're, we're doing this, you know, we do this efficiently. Um, and it's sort of obvious why we need to do a join. Uh, you know, this idea of a relational model that we're going to break up a, a, our, our database into these relations. And, you know, we didn't really talk about normalization, denormalization, but the idea is we want to split these up into the relations into these atomic units so we reduce the amount of redundancy and wasted space. But now we, when we want to answer queries, we've got to put things back together. Right? And that, that's, that's what a joins is going to do, us, do for us. Now, if you sort of paid attention or if you were cognizant of what was going on in the database world 10 years ago when the NoSQL stuff was super hot, right? All those NoSQL systems were claiming that joins are super wasteful, super slow, and you don't want to do them, and their, their database systems are explicitly not going to support joins. Uh, well, they were all wrong, and now pretty much all of them support joins in one way, one form of another, right? So joins are super important. It's the right way to, to, to well, it's not the right way, but it's the, it's the, it's the way we're going to be able to take uh, data that we've, we've partitioned or normalized out and put it back together to answer queries. 
no matter what's doing OLAP or OTP, at the end of the day, you're going to do joints. Um, for OLAP systems, joint algorithms are going to be super important because the research basically shows they're going to spend roughly maybe like 15 to 50 percent of the time of a query doing joints. So we make sure that this is uh, we do this efficiently, most efficiently as possible. We'll talk about how to do distributed joins later in the semester, and those systems are going to spend even more time doing joins, uh, execution time doing joins, because they have to move data around between between nodes, which is expensive, right? So the joint operator we're going to have is be able to reconstruct the a, a normalized uh, tuple across the cross relations back into the its original form, right? Without any information loss, right? We're going to assume that our joins are going to be correct, that are going to produce the right result, uh, and it's really about worrying about how how fast we can make these things. So for this lecture, we're going to focus on uh, a specific category or type of join. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about a binary join, meaning taking two relations to two tables and joining them together. And we're going to focus on the inner equijoin algorithms. So inner join means I'm looking for an ex uh, there's a match from, from the outer table or the, the, the left relation and the right relation. I have to find a match for that. Uh, and the equijoin means I'm using a quality uh, operator, a quality predicate, like something equals something. Something on the, on the, on the one table equals something in another table. There are anti-joins or uh, inequality joins. We're using like range predicates or not equals. That's a whole other set of algorithms. We'll worry about that later. Uh, the inner join and inner echo join is the most common one, so we're going to focus on that. And with the easy extension, we can we can go we can use left outer joins and right outer joins uh, using the same algorithms as well. For binary joins, it means we're taking two tables and putting them together. There is an exit. There are exi there are multi-way join algorithms that exist. Like, can I take three tables and four tables and join them together at the same time in a single algorithm? Uh, but they pretty much only exist in, in research. Uh, I've only known two systems that actually try to build a multi-way join. The first was Microsoft for SQL Server in like the late 90s. Um, they added multi-way joins in 98. But then it turns out like it was uh, not super janky, but like it made the system's performance unreliable or unstable. So they ended up removing it in 2001. Right, and then more recently, the only system I know that's doing multi-way joins now is uh, this system called Relational AI. Uh, they have some, some algorithm called the Dovetail Join algorithm, which I, I could post on Piazza. But they're the only ones that are actually doing this. Pretty much all the systems are going to be doing uh, binary joins. We can talk about multi-way joins in the uh, in, in in the advanced class if you want. So the, another thing I'm going to keep mindful of is that in general. Uh, for all these algorithms, we're going to have the smaller table of the two tables we're trying to join be the outer table, or the, the table on the left side of the join operator. And then the larger table will be on the will be the inner table, or the right side. Now, I'll explain what outer and inner, uh, the outer table and inner table means in a second. But the in general, when you look at like query plans, the, the sort of common convention is that the the so you're facing so on the left side of, of the operator as you look at it. That'll be considered the outer table, and the right side will be the inner table. Some systems like Snowflake, I think, flip them. Right? There's no common thing, but like if we use outer versus inner, people will know what you mean, right? And it's going to be up to the query optimizer in our database system to figure out how we're actually going to figure out the order of these two things. So we're not going to describe how we're going to do that just now. We'll do that after the midterm. But just know that the the, the query optimizer's job is going to be to try to figure out. Okay, this table, this, you know, these, I want to join these two tables. This one's larger than the other one, so let me put this one to be the outer, or sorry, let me put this one to be the inner, and this one to be the outer. It can certainly get it wrong, and it will get it wrong, but it's trying to at least make an approximation to figure out the ordering for you. There are techniques where uh, you can start running the join algorithm, realize you got the ordering incorrect, and, and then stop and reverse it. Uh, but that's it's called adaptive query optimization. Again, it's one of the things that exists in the research literature. I don't. I don't really know any system that actually tries to do that because um, it's expensive to like stop everything, throw it away, and start over. Okay, so uh, the all right. So actually, what did they click here? Sorry. Uh, I showed this this before. This is our query plan that we talked about, and then we're going to convert this into a some you know, that represents our, our query plan, and then the the. The output of the of each operator is essentially going to be the, the result of whatever it's computation it's doing, and we're going to feed that up into the operator above us in the tree. And the amount of data we're moving, what kind of data we're moving, again, that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Right? 
Uh, actually, we'll talk yeah, again. Actually, starting on, on Thursday, we'll talk about that. Right? But that thing, the other thing I talked about before was before. Therefore, the, here's the best join algorithm I should use. And here's the ordering of the tables I, I should use when I do the join. Right? So in our join implementation, there's sort of two decisions we have to make first. Uh, and these are not really something you do, like, how to say this? You wouldn't necessarily look, try different variants of these different design decisions at runtime. Typically, these are like baked into the system itself. Like when you implement it, someone has to make the decision, okay, we're going to do our joins or we're going to in this certain way. Right? There isn't, there usually isn't systems that try to switch dynamically and try to figure out what the best way. Because it's, from an engineering perspective, it's, it's too complicated to maintain you know, a bunch of different code paths. So the first question is, what is the what does our output look like for the for the join operator that we're going to pass up into the tree? And then the next question is going to be, how are we going to determine whether join algorithm implementation is going to be better than another? Right? Assuming our database system can support a bunch of these different join algorithms. The lower end systems uh, usually only support one, maybe two. The high end systems, like the commercial guys, Postgres as well, they're going to support a bunch of different algorithms. So therefore, they can make a choice at runtime uh, which algorithm to use. Yes? So yeah, so his question is, in this example here, where's the concept of an outer table versus an inner table? Again, this is a logical plan, so I'm not specifying, right? The the convention that people use when, when query plans, when you show these diagrams, is usually the one on the left is the outer, the one on the right is the inner. But it doesn't have to be. Right? I think when you dump out like I mean, Yeah, sometimes sometimes uh, some data systems have the ability to dump out visual representations of the query plans. And it's usually the, the, the outer will be on the left, right? Logically, if this, the order of the table doesn't matter. At this point, for this, for this query plan here, the, log, the logical order doesn't matter, right? Because it's just a diagram, right? This is not even saying, it's not saying do I do a nested loop, hash join, start merge join. It just says join. Well, again, we'll talk about query optimization and uh, uh, after the midterm. But the way to think about it is you first do as much you do as much optimization you can on a logical plan, all right, where you don't have to worry about maybe the specific ordering of certain things. And then when you were to convert it to a physical plan that you actually need to execute, then you start worrying about these things. So you start to do the optimization in two stages. Oh, shoot, sorry. All right, so the first question is, what is, the, what is our joint operator actually going to output? And we certainly talked about this before. We talked about... Uh, Early materialization, late materialization, which we'll go over again, but it's more than just that. It's like, you know, what is the amount of data I'm spitting out? What is it, what does the data look like, and uh, how do I keep track of like here's the things that actually match? And again, we're assuming here that the 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 joint algorithm is correct, meaning like it's, like if it's this algorithm versus that algorithm, it's always going to produce the same logical result. Like here's the tuples that match, but the ordering can differ, right? The order can differ on the output. Right, because if it's a sort merge join algorithm, the output's going to come out sorted. If it's a hash join, it could come out unsorted, or will come out unsorted. Maybe I spit out uh, tuples one at a time. Maybe I'm spitting out tuples in a batch. Right, from a relational algebra perspective, it doesn't care. Right, but in the implementation, we actually we actually are going to care. Right, and so there's some there's some logic in the query optimizer that can reason about what's above the join in the query tree. And recognize that, oh, it needs to be sorted, therefore maybe I should just do the sort merge join algorithm, because then I don't have to do the sorting up above, because it already gets sorted as, as I need, right? So there's all this, this additional logic we have to care about uh, to help us make the decision whether we want to use one algorithm versus another. Yes? For a lot of these decisions, it seems like they come down to like some heuristic or intuition. Are there like any benchmarks that help database developers figure out whether these heuristics were actually good in like a practical sense? So his, his statement is, a lot of the things I'm saying seem to be these heuristics decide is one approach better than another. Is there any benchmark or any uh, even analytical, analytical reasoning or models we could use to determine one is better than another? Um, I mean, there's, there's standard database benchmarks that people use uh, for like you know, evaluating like sort of one system versus another. And even actually within, within the system itself, given, given a design decision. 
Um, in practice, there's like a bunch of literature that maybe tries to look at a bunch of different approaches, but in, in general, most systems sort of pick one and just stick with it, right? And sometimes when you push them, push the actual developers of these systems and say, why you do things a certain way, it basically comes down to like, oh yeah, this is the way the last guy did it or something like that. You know, it's, it's never like a deep, deep reasoning. Okay. Yeah. But there'll be some design decisions that we make that will influence how we make, how, why we do some things one way versus another. So again, if I'm doing a column store, then maybe I wanna do late materialization versus early materialization. Right? So some things are influenced by what, what happens below you in the system. All right, so we talked about early materialization and late materialization before, but I just want to go over it again in the context of joins, right? So say we're jo doing this table joining R and S, right? And say it's, it's really simple uh, data set with, with, you know, a small number of tuples. The output of the join is basically stitching the, 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 the attributes from R with attributes S, producing this sort of new tuple that has, has the combination of both the attributes, right? Um, and then, so that's essentially what's going to be the output of the join operator that I shove up into the next projection operator, who can then do whatever it wants, right? So the idea is here is like in, in, the, in the scans on R and S, right, the access methods on R and S, and I'm, not, I'm not saying whether I'm getting an index scan or a sequential scan, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna materialize all the tuples, that it, all the attributes for the tuple, and then pass them up, up into the tree, right? So this approach would be bad if the tables R and S are really wide, have a lot of attributes, because uh, then I'm copying a lot of excess data that I don't actually need up above. But if the selectivity of the join is really, really small, like it's only going to emit one or two tuples, then maybe the wide column actually doesn't matter. Right? So in this case here, an optimization we can do is obviously push down the, the projection on uh, in, in, in this oper operator here, because it only needs ID and, 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 the, and the, the creation date. So set up pass it could do the projection in this join operator and then only pass up the subset of the data that I actually need. Yes? If you're the new user and you're just like optimized to join out, if like you're joining like our ID is just set up that you have not need to ask, do you just get to get the So your question, could I, could I, could I even, uh, yeah, so his point here, uh, his, well, no, no, no. So his statement is, in this here, if I'm doing a, jar, a join on RID and SID, couldn't I just get rid of the join entirely? The answer is no, because you don't know the, the relationship between R and S. Like I could have one to, man, one to one, in your case, yes, that would work, but one to many or many to many, so you wouldn't be able to do that. That is actually logic that the system could figure out. Could, like if it knows that, oh, RID is the primary key and SID is the primary key, and therefore it's, it's going to be one to one. You, it, it could be smart enough to try to remove that. Anyway, the main thing about this though is like at at once we're like as we go through the query plan, since we have for the we need to go back to the original tables, right? We pay that cost up front, uh, and hope it works out that we that the the amount of data that we we pass along doesn't become too odorous. And therefore, it would have been better just to, to not bring everything along, which is what late materialization does. All right, so same join, uh, but now in my output of the join operator, instead of passing along the actual values, uh, with R and S, I only pass, and I pass around the, just the, the record ID for each tuple that matches. And then at the other parts in the tree, uh, like when I need the customer date, or the creation date, I use the record ID to go find the actual attribute that, that, with the data that I, that I need, right? As I said, this is ideal for column storage because we're not copying around a lot of data that we don't actually need. So a lot of systems, the, the, the column store systems would, would use this. One of the first column store systems was Vertica, uh, and they used it, they, they made a big deal about this 15 years ago, um, but then, then they told me, uh, before the pandemic that they actually got rid of this optimization because it turned out to be just better off just go fetch all the data at the beginning, do early materialization. Uh, and you, cause you know what the, you know what the performance cost is that of that's going to be at the very beginning. And it makes the, the performance of the query more, more stable because the, the number of times I'm going to have to go fetch some data 
for this, this operator up here depends on the number of tuples that come out of the join. And if I don't know, if I can't correctly predict how many tuples are going to come out of the join, then sometimes the query will be really fast, sometimes the query will be really slow. Or if I go fetch everything all, all at the very beginning, then no matter what the predicate is uh, that I'm doing my join on, the cost of the query is roughly the same. And for some people, that for a lot of, a lot of businesses, stable query performance is better than sort of having some queries be super fast all the time and some be super slow. Yes? Uh, so your statement is, for this example, early materialization, isn't it better to have the, the, the outer table be the larger one? Yeah. Because why, sorry? So, uh, or like the wider one, sorry. The wider one be, I mean, that's, like, sorry, more tuples or wider? Why, why? That it's better to have the wider one be in the outer? Yeah, or is the length of number of tuples? Yeah, so your statement is, is the, is the number of tuples versus the number of attributes more important? The number of tuples is usually more important, yes. I can imagine, like, uh, you know, corner cases where, like, you have up to, like, you know, you know 16,000 tuples, or, six, sorry, 16,000 attributes, which I think is up, upper, upper bound of uh, Postgres. Oracle famously only allows for 1,000 columns. Um, it's hard-coded in the code. It used to be like 200 in the 90s, and they, some guy spent two months fixing it. It was so painful, they said they're never going to go back and do it again. right? So they only support 1,000 thousand, thousand columns, because it's, it's pound to find in there. Um, Postgres is 2 to the 16. I think a bunch of other systems are 2 to the 16. OK. All right, the other thing that's going to be different is uh, how we're going to determine whether one algorithm is better than another. So again, we'll talk about the query, optimi after query optimizer uh, uh, after the midterm. The basic idea is that it's going to try to figure out some internal has some internal cost model to say this one algorithm is better than another. Um, and the 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 unit of measurement they're going to use for this cost metric is is going to be entirely on IOs, right? Because I said in the beginning in this class we care about the, the the number of times I got to read and write the disk, and maybe care less about like the performance of once stuff is in memory. Uh, because, the, the, again, the disk is so slow, although that's slowly changing with, with modern hardware. But for now, we assume the disk is always the bottleneck. And so the, the cost spec we're going to use is the number of, I, number of IOs to compute the join. And so the variables we're going to use going forward in this lecture is that we're going to assume we have two tables, R and S, because we're only doing binary joins. And we're going to say hey, we have big M pages in R. And then of, you know, within the M pages, we have M total tuples in the, in the relation. And then we'll have uppercase N to, uh, pages in S, and then lowercase n tuples in S as well. And so again, we're, we're going to ignore the computation, computation cost for what things are memory, and we're also going to ignore the cost of the output uh, of, of the join operator, because that, again, that'll vary based on whatever the, the selectivity of the predicate is, depends on the data, and that's really hard for us to compute at this point. OK? All right, so the, the first thing to also bring up is also the cross product. Right, that's like the, that's the most simple join te technically. It's just taking two for loops, and just matching everything, without actually just, like just combining every other tuple on the outer table with every other tuple on the inner table, and then once you produce that giant output, then you go back and apply the filter to remove anything. Uh, it's like the most naive, but also like the worst way to possibly do a join. So there are some cases where you do want to do a cross product, like they, you can explicitly say, I want to do a cross join in SQL. Then you get this algorithm. Uh, but from a theoretical standpoint, this is something we could evaluate to say this is a possible way to implement our join. But we know this is always going to be slow. So some systems, or actually all systems, either don't consider it or throw this, this, up, throw this possibility out right away. Right? So, so the cross join could exist, but we can ignore that entirely for, the, for this. Uh, for this. And inner join is going to be the most common join we have to we have, we'll support. After that, it's left outer join, which is just, again, a, a, an extension to the inner join. All right, so there's going to be three category of join algorithms we're, we're going to look at. So the nested loop join, uh, and then of that, we have different variants. The sort merge join will be very similar to the, the external merge sort we talked about last class. And then the hash join would be the one we want to focus on the most, because that's going to be, in, in general, that's going to be the best, the, 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 it's going to be the fastest and be the best in almost all cases. 
For OLAP, you probably almost always want to do a hash join. If your applet needs to be sorted and the, and the sort key is the same thing as the join key, then you want to use sort merge because you get the sorting for free. But then if it's OLATP where you're going looking up like, like one or two number of records and you already have an index, then you want to use the index nest loop join. Okay? And again, the, the different database systems will have different implementations of these sort of three category of, of, of join algorithms. Some systems like Postgres and SQL Server and DB2 and Oracle, they'll support all of these. I think MySQL only support, or used to only support nested loop join for the longest time. I think they added hash join maybe like five years ago. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, some, if you're optimized for OTP, then you can get by pretty, you can get pretty far with the nested loop join. All right, so let's look at the, the basic nested loop join. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's basic. There's this notion of an outer table and an inner table. We refer to that because if you think of the nested loop join, it's just two nested for loops. So on the, the outermost uh, uh, for loop, we would call that the outer table, and the innermost one is, is the inner, right? And all we're doing is for every single tuple in the outer table, we're going to go look at every single tuple in the inner table. If they match on our join predicate, which we don't really care what it is at this point, then we say, you know, we have a match, and we emit that in our output. And as I said, the, the visually, when people represent these, these query plan diagrams, the outer table will be on the left, the inner table will be on the right. All right? So this is the dumbest thing you could do. Yes? Because so cross product, you, you remove this part. It's the same thing. Right? You're, not, you're not checking any predicate. All right, so this is, this is the dumbest way to do a join, right? And because it's so naive, it's basically for every single tuple that we have in the, in the outer table, we're going to look at every single tuple in the inner table. And every time we, we, on the outer table we switch to the next tuple, we scan all, completely all over again. So there's no notion of pages, no notion of cache locality, no notion of a buffer pool here. We're just blindly going and grabbing every single tuple we can. Yes? <coughs> So his statement is for, for this naive, stupid join algorithm, it doesn't matter what the outer versus the inner. Yes. All right, so what does this actually cost us? So it's going to be m plus, uh, m plus little m times big N. So we're going to look at every, every single page in the, in the uh, outer table. We've got to go fetch every single page for every single tuple on the inner table. Right? So, so it's the, the formula is basically m plus m, little m times n. So this seems very abstract. Yes? Can't we just buffer the part? We'll, we'll get, his statement is, can't we just buffer this? Yes, we'll get to that. Yes? I'm a bit confused why there's being a thing to n like n pages, but what if you need to take out the n part of it? Why do we have to take little m times n? Yeah, why, why do we have to do that? Because like for every single, so you, you go grab a page in the outer table. That's, that's the, the first m, the big m here, right? And then for every single tuple on that, you're going to go fetch every single page on the inner table. So you still, statement, there's no buffering. There's no notion of like, oh, yeah, this page, I, if I bring this page in, I can do a bunch of scans. Right? It's, it's blindly going to the next page over and over again. So let's put some numbers behind this. Uh, so say we have a simple database. It has a, uh, table R has 1,000 1, 1, pages with 100,000 tuples. Table N has 500 pages with 40,000 tuples. Right? So the basic cost analysis would be, if this is, we take 50 million IOs. So see if you have a reasonably fast D that can do a scan in 100,000 uh, or 1,000 microseconds or so, uh, the total time to do this naive, you know, join is 1.3 hours, right? So if you put the smaller table on the outside, then we do a little bit better, and now we get to 1.1 hours. So if you do some basic math on, on, on my example table here, right? Uh, assuming I have four kilobyte pages, this 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 database is six megabytes, right? That easily fits in L3. But if I'm going to get for every single tuple, if I'm going to get every single page, then like it's I'm going to get crushed. So in this in this one, like, because for each tuple you have to fetch the whole page. Yes. So, uh, well, I mean, so his statement is, the insane part is that for every single tube, I've got to fetch the whole page. Yes, because again, we, we are, 
we are uh, it's a block it's a page oriented storage on disk right so we can't go pull out the exact like byte sequence we want we got to go fetch the entire entire pages in now I'm using four kilobyte pages I can have larger pages right if I'm in, in my database but again the math basically is the same yes but if we do take So you save it as, again, so if you take CPU cache into, to, if I, again, six megabytes will fit in L3. So yes, I wouldn't actually have to go to disk. I'm just trying to show you, if you have to go to disk, like how bad it actually is. So to the point he brought up, like, can't you just be, you know, can't you, uh, can't you just buffer things? Because you know you bring things into memory and do as much processing as you, you want to bring things into memory for the outer table and the inner table. Yes, that's called the block nest, nested loop join. And this is what people would, you know, this is more realistic. This is what people actually would implement, right? So for each block or page in the outer table, uh, then I go fetch a block on the inner table. And then for each, each tuple in the outer table block, I look at each tuple in the inner table block. If they match, then, then produce the output, right? And now we're doing a little better because now our cost is going to be uh, M plus big M times big N. Right? So for every single page on the outer table, I go fetch that once. And then for every single page of the outer table, I go fetch all the, the, uh, the, the inner, inner, inner table pages. Yes? So is block uh, exactly the same as page in, uh, in this case? Yes. Yeah, so the same as, is block the same thing as page? Yes. I'm using the terms interchangeably. Yes. I think the textbook calls this block nested loop join. Buffer nested, nested loop join, same idea. Just we're making our algorithm be aware that we, there's this notion of, of pages or blocks where we can bring things in, and there'll be more than one more than one tuple inside that page, or could pot potentially be more than one tuple inside that page. Yes. So here we only have to assume that we have like two buffer pages, like one for the outer table and one for the inner table. Yeah. So it, so his statement, and he's correct in this example here. I'm assuming we only have two buffer pages, one for the outer, one for the inner. Yes. And a, th a third for the output. So again, we want to put the smaller table as the outer table, and we want to base this on the, the number of pages uh, between one table and not the number of tuples, because again, the, the, the number of tuples per page could vary, and it's all about re reducing the amount of uh, page reads I have to do from, from disk. So we go back to my simple example I had before, right? I have table R, table, table S with 1,000 pages versus 500 pages. Uh, now, when I, when I do the math, uh, I come down to, from 50 million IOs, uh, I'm down to, to 500,000, right? And now I'm down to 50 seconds. We went from one hour to 50 seconds, just by being aware of we can, we can keep things in memory uh, and process it as much as possible. I think the textbook might use like a spinning disk hard drive for these examples uh, with like a, you know, like a five millisecond seek time. Uh, so their, their numbers are like, you know, one minute for these joints, right? But th these numbers are more realistic in, in modern hardware. All right, so the example he brought up is, what if I have more buffers, right? So again, if I say I have B buffers and assume that one buffer is, is one page, uh, so I have B minus two buffers for scanning the outer table because I always have to have one buffer for the, uh, for the inner table, sorry, for, 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 for the inner table and, and, the, and the storing the output, right? And the basic algorithm looks like this. So B minus two pages, fetch all, fetch all the pages I can for the outer relation. Then for each page on the inner relation, I do the same matching that I had before and produce the output if the, if the, the joint predicate evaluates are true. So now, again, we go back to our example four for the, for the formula. Now it's the M on the outer, the outer part. It's the ceiling of M divided by M, M divided by B minus two times N. So again, I have to do a complete pass on the outer table. Then for m divided by b minus two buffers on the inner table, right? If the outer relation fits entirely into memory, uh, th then we're golden because now we we we're just it's just m plus n. Go fetch the entire uh, outer outer relation, bring that into memory, and go fetch for just do a one sequential pass on the inner relation. Now we're down to 1,500 IOs, right? And doing this in, in uh, 150 milliseconds. That's starting to look reasonable. Yes? So for these IO times, we only talk about 
accessing pages from this internet link? Or... So his statement is, uh, for these I.O. times, I'm only considering the cost of fetching things into memory. Uh, for this algorithm, for, for the nested loop join stuff, you never write anything back out, right? Because I, I bring it to memory, I check to see whether it matches, and then, it, and then once I'm done with it, I just throw it away. I'm not writing anything. The bottleneck is the copy and not the computation of it. The bottleneck is, is, the, bottleneck is the, di the, the reading from the, from the disk, from the hardware into, into main memory, yes. I think I mentioned there's some algorithms, there, sorry, there's some hardware where you can actually push down the predicates onto the hardware itself. Like they have little ARM cores down there. You can do some, some filtering down there, but we can ignore that. Yes. So in practice, like are all of your buffers available if you're doing a join or like if, if you, are you having other buffers which are going to be used for other operators? So his question is, uh, not for the, not for the, these algorithm analysis, about in a real system, do, should I assume that all my buffers that I have for memory, would that be used for joins? No. So the, the way it works in, in certain systems, you can, you can specify how much memory you want to dedicate for each query to use for joins. And, right? and then if once it exceeds that, that sort of threshold, then, then it actually spills the disk. So you can tell the, you can tell the data system, like I want to use one gig of memory in total, but then I want to use maybe one megabyte per, per query to use that for my join. And if I, if I exceed that, then I spill the disk. So the amount of memory in the system that can be used for joins at any given time is the number of active queries doing joins at any given moment. And so the number, the number of active queries depends on some other knob you can set. Yes? What if you don't need one buffer for flow and output? You just directly write it sequentially to the disk. So that's gonna change T minus two to T minus one. So his statement is, question is, what if I don't use, what if I don't buffer, uh, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't use a buffer to store the output and I just write it to disk. Yeah. Uh, and at the end, you have to load that from the disk. How about that actually? You can't, like, how does that work? You can't do that. Whenever you find a match, you just do but, sequential write to the disk. But what does that mean to sequential write? What does that mean? What, like, what's the sys call to do that? Right. Yeah, but, but, but what do you pass into the sys call? Oh. A buffer, right? You can't like you can't like you can't wave a magic wand and like bits appear on disk, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's not a joke. I mean, like I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to uh, dismiss your question, but like the there are uh, like classic POSIX API like fwrite. You have to pass in a buffer, so that that's our buffer there, right? There are uh, like NVMe and uh, there are like APIs in modern. Uh, in, in modern Linux, where you can do like kernel bypass to do direct writes to the hardware to avoid like this, the buffering stages within the OS, but even then you got to pass a buffer, right? But can the buffer be super small? Like uh, ten bytes. Like ten bytes? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could do it, but the, the OS is not going to be happy about it, or the hardware's not going to be happy about it because it's going to turn into a four kilobyte block no matter what, right? Um. I was going to say something else too. Uh, there's something called IOU ring uh, in, in newer Linux where like you basically get a circle buffer. Uh, that's for mostly reading though. You can get like a shared buffer that like is shared with like the hardware or the OS where like it's, I mean, it still has to be allocated. So it still has to count for an our join algorithm, which this is getting more advanced, but like there is a way to like basically get a, a shared buffer where you could write things in and not have to allocate, do additional malloc in join algorithm, but like, at the end of the day, you need memory to put something somewhere, right? Yes? Uh, so since you mentioned actual control, how come you have, because this is tokenized and tables, right? Yes. Like, does it really, does it matter if we're accessing contiguous tables on disk, or for modern SSD, we can just, as long as we remain with the same form of and sequential writing? So the statement is here, like, uh, I made a big deal about how sequential IO was going to be faster than random IO, even on modern SSDs. It might, is there any consideration I'm making for this in my joint algorithm at this point here? Well, I'm scanning through the table, right? One page after another. That's if it's, if the, if the, if the disk manager has laid out those pages sequentially on disk, then this is all sequential IO, right? Because again,
if I'm accessing each page, well, if the pages are sequential on the hardware, then like I get the benefits of sequential I/O. Oh. Yeah. Because I found modern SSD sufficient for my scanning to take you know, lengthy applications. His statement is in a in a modern SSD, it 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 has it, it gets better performance on random I/O than a sequential sequential disk hard drive. That is true. Yes, but even then, modern SSDs like there's a whole. It's basically a whole other computer down there. And it's going to organize things in. If you give it a, 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 a byte stream all at once, it will try to put them sequentially together. Okay, so we're always better off with storing pages contiguously. Your statement is you're always better off storing things contiguously on disk. Yes. Um, I, 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 remind me, I posted Piazza. There's some. There's always some benchmarks that come out, uh, and there's a tool called FIO you can use for micro benchmarking. And people just, you know, they take the new SSDs that come out. And they show that like sequential I/O. It's not the gap isn't as huge as it is, is in a spinning disk hard drive. But it still exists. Yes. Uh, use one buffer for scanning output output disk to batch output. When the buffer gets full, do you write it out to disk? Yeah. So his statement is, um, in my example here, I'm using one buffer for the output, uh, but when it gets full, where does it actually go? I'm ignoring that for now. I think I said in the beginning in our calls, we we ignore the cost of of the outputs of where it goes, right? Because it depends on how the system is actually implemented. Because it may be the case that like once my buffer is full then I pause the join algorithm and then hand the buffer up to the next operator and let it do whatever it wants to do. Or maybe I send that to another machine. It, for, for our purposes here, we, we can ignore that. All right, so let's get through the nested loop join stuff quickly because, it's, it's, again, it's not the main focus. So why is it so bad? Again, it's, it's, it's very naive. It's a brute force search. For every single tube on the outer table, we're just doing sequential scan to check match on the inner table. Um, and even if we, if we do, do buffering, you know, we're still looking at everything. So one thing the system can do, though, if it already has an index uh, on the table we're using for the join, we can use that index or use, convert that table to be the, the, out, the inner table. And then now as we scan through the outer table with one tuple after another, we can just probe that index uh, and do the lookup and find the thing that we're looking for, right? So this is called the index nested loop join. And this is what... Uh, in most LTP systems, this is what they will implement. Because it's usually things like, for Andy's uh, Andy's account ID, find all the orders he made. And you would you have, you have an index on maybe the order ID with the user ID, and you can probe that into easily probe into that index and find it find your matches. All right. So we're just going to do a naive scan on the outer table, and then for every single uh, tuple in the in the outer table, do a probe in the index. And if we find up a match, then we, we reproduce our output, right? So the cost now is m plus little m times c. Oh, shit. Uh, every time. So the c thing is this constant factor that we, it's hard for us to quantify because it, it depends, on what the, uh, depends on what the index actually is, right? And it depends on what the, the lookup on the index actually is doing. Right? If it's a unique index, then for one key lookup, I'm going to produce one tuple. But it may be the case that it's a non-unique index, a secondary index, and that one probe may produce, I don't know, a billion tuples, a million tuples. I, we don't know. Right? So we just say it's just some constant factor C that's undefined at, at this point in our analysis for these algorithms. But in a real system, you would, you would, have, you would know what the index actually is, and you have a rough estimate of what the selectivity would be, and that can determine whether the index nested loop join is a good idea or not. Right? And there's also, uh, going back here, no, oh, this is broken. Ah. In my example here, I'm just doing a sequential scan on the, on, the, on the outer table. That also could be an index scan as well. Right? But the, again, the, the idea I'm just trying to show here is that on the inner table, instead of doing a sequential scan, I do a probe into an index. And this is essentially what the hash join is going to be as well. We're going to build a hash table index uh, and then do probes inside of that. Yes? His statement is, can I think of C as, as the amount of number of pages we're going to access in the index probe? Yes. But again, like it may be the case it's, it's one, you know, one traversal down, find, you know, find exactly what I want in a single page, or maybe traversal down, which would be log in, but then I just scan across. And then the traversal doesn't matter because the error will be in the index. Uh, the traversal doesn't matter because uh, no guarantee. Oh, we're not assuming the index is already in memory. We, we can't assume the index is already in memory. Yes. You say, yeah, we, we can't assume the index fits in memory or not. Do you have, do you have the index on the search key? 
Is Dave, his question is, do I have to, does my index have to be an exact match on the search key? No. Like I could have like a prefix of the, of the, of the joint predicate, but like that gets me in, at least to the leaf nodes and then I could scan along and, and then I would have then have to do an initial predicate evaluation on every tuple that had come out of, come out of the leaf node to see whether it matches my joint and then produce the output. Your statement is you don't see why it ma why this is a good idea because I still have to traverse the I, I traverse the index, I go fetch the the page that, that the index points to, and then do additional check. Uh, it's certainly better than than like blindly sequential scanning the, the inner table, right? Again, assume you, you don't want to assume the, the the cardinality between the inner and the outer table, right? It could be one to one, one to many, right? So it could be like for one, it could be one to one. In that case, this is this is beautiful because I I. I probe down on the inner table on the index, and I get one tuple that I need. Maybe you get nothing, but it's better. Uh, sure. Like so, a no match versus a match for our purposes doesn't matter. I still have to pay the cost to do the lookup. All right. So key summaries for this: uh, okay, we always want to put the outer, the small table to be the outer table. We try to buffer as much of the outer table we can into memory as possible. And then we loop over the inner table. And if we have an index, we'll use it. Some systems will actually build the index for you on the fly. And it's, again, essentially what a hash join is going to do for us. Uh, but in the case of the SQL server, they'll actually build a B plus tree index uh, to do your join. And then if you do it enough, I think they give you a warning and say, hey, you probably should add this index. We're using it a lot. Uh, it would be a good idea. So again, we talked about this, the stupid join, uh, the nested loop join. Nobody does that. The block one is probably the uh, most common. And then for OLTP systems, you definitely need an index nested loop join. Okay? All right, so now the sort merge join. And I think I said this last class uh, when we talked about join algorithms. So this is the sort merge join. But then within the sort phase of the sort merge join, you can use the external merge sort that we talked about last time. And I'll just try to be clear when we're talking about what. But for actually, for this, for this, this, per, this lecture here, we don't care what the, what the sorting algorithm actually is. If it's quick sort, heap sort, whatever, we don't care. We just assume that the data is coming back sorted after we're done with it, right? So the first phase, we're going to sort both the inner table and outer table based on the join keys. And then in the merge phase, we're going to have two cursors that are going to walk through the outer and inner table together, sort of in lockstep. And we're going to check to see whether we have matches. And depending whether we do have a match or don't have a match, we will iterate the, one of the cursors down versus the other. And in the case to identify uh, uh, if we have, based on the join type and whether there could be duplicates, we may have to backtrack on the, uh, on the inner table, put the cursor back up, and then do a scan again. But the basic idea here is that because it's sorted, we would know what the boundaries of, of how far we have to go back. We don't have to jump back to the very beginning, as you would have to do an nested loop join. We can jump back to some, some other starting point that, that's not all the way back. Again, in the worst case scenario, if you only have one value, for you know, for your join key, then then you're, there's nothing you can do for that. You have to jump back. To, you jump back to the beginning, no matter what. But in practice, most times you, you don't have to worry about that. So this is the join algorithm. Uh, I, I don't like showing code in class, but uh, I'll, I'll walk through a visual example next. So basically, here's the first phase where we sort both R and S. Then we build cursors on the R, the sorted R and sorted S. And then while our cursors are not completed, uh, in particular for the outer outer table. We'll just check to see whether we have a match. Uh, and we produce the output. And if we know that one is greater than another, we have to increment the, the other, the other uh, cursor. I don't see any backtracking. Yeah, so he said there's no backtracking. For simplicity, I, I didn't show that. Let's walk through an example. We'll see what it means. Yes. All right, so say again, we, here's our same join we had before. We join R and S. So first thing we're going to do is sort uh, R and S on, on the ID columns. right? And then we produce our output like this. And then now we have the cursors at the very beginning. And we're just going to compare the join keys of the outer table and the inner table. And in this case here, since our ID is 100, SID is 100, that's a match. So we, we, we put the, the join tuple in our output buffer. And then we're going to increment the cursor on the inner table. So we move the cursor down on S like this. Do the same comparison right, on RID and SID. Again, both are 100, so we have another match. And we increment down the uh, the inner inner cursor. 
Now, this point here, uh, the RID, the cursor on R is pointing to 100. Cursor on S is pointing to 200. So since 200 is greater than 100, we know we need to increment the, the outer cursor, right? And we're never going to have to backtrack on the, on the outer table for, for inner join. Now we do a comparison. Now 200 equals 200. So we produce that in our output. We increment the, outer, the, the inner, inner, inner table's uh, cursor. 200 is less than 400, right? So we increment the outer one. But now we see we get, we get 200 again, right? So in this case, here, uh, we, ha we have to keep additional metadata to know that we need to backtrack our cursor to the last value that we saw, right? In this case, so we saw 400. The last distinct value we saw was 200. And that either could be exactly the previous one, which in my example here it is, or it could be some number hops away because I have 200 repeated. I need to jump to the first 200, right? And now I, I can do my comparison again to produce the additional uh, result in my output buffer. Same thing, inner one in increments to, to 400. 200 is less than 400, so I increment this one. 300 is less than 400, so I increment this one again. Now I have 400 equals 400, produce the output. Then I get 500 here. Produce, uh, go, this, this moves down, I get 500. Now since this is a match, I don't have to go back to 400 because I know I've, uh, I, you know, I've, I, there's nothing above this. Uh, there's nothing above this 500 that could possibly match with this because I didn't see 500 before on the inner table. And then I reach the end, and I and I know I'm done, and I don't have to backtrack on this side here. Is that clear? So the, again, I, we didn't, we're not talking about left outer joins, but the way to think about it also too, if, you, if you're doing instead of inner join, a, a left outer join. If I if I'm if I, anytime. If I don't on my cursor here, uh, I can just produce the, the result with, with the balls for the inner table. It's basically how you would use this to, to, to do left outer joins or outer joins. All right, so what's the complexity to do this? So it's the same uh, sorting cost we saw from the last class, assuming we have uh, a bunch of buffers. Um, so we have to pay the penalty or pay the cost to sort the outer table, pay the cost to sort the inner table. And then when we do our merge, we assume that uh, there's no backtracking here. Uh, we assume, because it's hard to identify what the actual page boundaries are for tuples. So for simplicity, assume there's no backtracking. So now the merge cost is just n plus n, right? Because we're going to scan through every single tuple in the outer, every page in the outer relation that's sorted, every single page in the inner relation that's sorted, uh, and do our merge. So just again, to simplify things, we just say it's n plus 1. So if we go now put it, the, the real numbers, Right, the from before, assuming you have a hundred buffer pages to, to do the processing, you end up with uh, 0 0.75 seconds. So we went from one hour with the naive join to I think one second for the uh, the blocked nested loop join, ignoring the in-memory nested loop join or the in and the index one we can't, can't can't identify. But now we're down to 0 0.75 seconds. So far, so good. Right, we're making progress. So the worst case scenario for a sort merge join is when the uh, there's again there's a single value on your join key, like everyone has ID equals one in the outer table and the inner table, so like you pay the the you know you pay the sort costs obviously but the sort is stupid because it's just everything's all one, and and then you do the merge right, so I mean I'm sure people people are stupid I'm sure somewhere in the world people have data sets where they you know have a billion tuples with one column they try to join it together. Uh, but in practice, this is not likely. The data system will do it because you asked it to do it. But like, I mean, like, like, you know, you can you can buy you can buy Drano. You're not supposed to drink it, but people drink it, right? Like, there's, there's nothing we can do to prevent this. So I've already said this. Uh, when is a sort merge useful? So if 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 both the, the the tables or at least one of the tables is already sorted on the join key, like if you have a clustered index, then you don't pay that sort cost. That's fantastic. Or also, too, if there's an order by clause on the, uh, on the query, and the order by clause just happens to be the same you know, subset of the keys, the same keys as your join, join operator, then you, you, you know, two for one, you do the sort merge join, and then you don't pay the, the sort cost at all. Right? Again, the query optimizer can be clever and try to figure out, OK, well, my join is only, is only going to produce one tuple or, or a small number of tuples. 
So who cares if the if I if I get the sorting for free? The hash join could could potentially or index nested loop join could still be better. Systems will also be aware too that since the if you're doing a an index nested loop join, since the index will be sorted, assuming it's a B plus tree, not a hash hash index, then that output will be sorted too, and then you potentially don't have to do the order by as well. Right. All right. So let's get to the more important, well, the, the most important one, the hash join. So the basic thing about this is that for so some tuple in R and some tuple in S, uh, if they're going to satisfy our join condition, like something equals something, then obviously these two values will have to, will have to be the same, right? My R ID has to equal my S ID. So if that's the case, then we know that they're going to hash to the same value as well because they are the same value, the same ha hash number, right? So the basic idea here is, is again a divide and conquer approach where we can assume since we can assume that they're going to hash to the same thing, we can use the you know, we basically build a hash table to allow us to quickly identify or uh, find the location in, in our hash table uh, that's going to have the tuple we need on, on the outer table or sorry the inner table, right? So again, the idea is here we're just limiting the amount of comparisons we have to do by scanning through the outer table once, building a hash table. And now we just probe into to the hash table with the inner table, right? And it's basically the same idea of the index nested loop join, except I have to build a hash table instead of having a, a B plus tree already existing, right? So the ha basic hash join algorithm has two phases. Phase one is the build build side, where you take the outer relation and then build a hash table with some hash function H H one uh, that's on your join attribute. Uh, and I, I sort of set that up. It could spill a disk if necessary. I use any of the hashing hash table techniques we talked about last week. Right? It, for now, it doesn't matter. In practice, though, if everything fits in memory, uh, linear probing usually is the best. If it doesn't fit memory, maybe uh, the, the, actually, yeah, linear probing usually always, is always the best. You always want to choose this. Simple is better in this case. You just want to be fast as possible. And then in the second phase, the probe phase, you scan for every single uh, tuple in the, in the inner relation. Use the same hash function, jump to the hash table, and see whether you, you have a match. All right, so it looks like this. Again, it's phase one, uh, we're going to build the hash table on our joint key on, on, the, uh, on the outer table. And then in phase two, again, just scan through the inner table, use the same hash function, and find a match. So the key in our hash table is going to be the attributes that we're joining on, right? So RID and SID, that we would use that as, as the joint key. Or sorry, the hashing key. Um, we always need to keep the original value of the, of the keys in, in the hash table as well, because we, if, in case of hashing collisions, we might land into a, a, a slot in our hash table, and we have to see whether the key that we're looking at actually truly is the one we're trying to do a join on. Otherwise, we could have false positives. And then the value, again, will vary based on the implementation. If it's early materialization, then you would have the entire, uh, entire tuple or the portion of the tuple you actually would need. If it's late materialization, it would just be the record ID. Right, but you would always keep you always want to keep a copy of the key uh, in the hash table to avoid that lookup when you do the comparison. All right, so what, how how fast is this? So, assuming we have uh, b minus one partitions in phase one, right? Uh, then the cost of doing doing this is b times b minus one. So, the number of pages we would need in n pages needs to be well, square root of n buffers because you always try to do powers of two, and so. It's basically you're just going to scan through, build a hash table, and then do the probe. There's this fudge factor idea here where if you, since we don't know at this point what the, how skewed the data actually is, so you may actually have some uh, hash buckets actually spill to disk because everything's hashed into the same location. We'll see an optimization for that in, in, in a second. But the basic idea is that like I can take a pass, one pass through the, the, the outer table, and one pass through, sorry, one pass through the outer table, build the hash table, Assuming b minus one things uh, uh, fill in, uh, spit, sit in memory, then one pass through the inner table, do the probe, and I, and I find my match, produce my output. And the fudge factor says whether how you know we'll have collisions, how many more things I have to look at. So one common optimization you can do for this is to add a bloom filter in front of the the, the, the hash table. I think someone brought this up earlier when we talked about hash tables before. Um, and I said, th this is, yes, this, this is a common optimization. And the basic idea is, is that the cost of going to the, the probe of the hash table is actually, it's non-trivial, right? You have to hash the, the, the key, 
but then you have to do that lookup, and it, depending on the collision rate and the the fill factor of your of your hash table, you may have to do a lot of comparisons to find the thing you're looking for, or find the empty slot if you're doing linear probing, and then know that you're done. So we can put a balloon filter in, in front of the hash table and use that as as a, as a quick and quick and dirty de determination whether the key you're looking for actually exists or not, without actually looking to the hash table. And the idea is that this balloon filter is going to be much smaller, more compact in memory than the actual hash table itself. So if I, depending on the selectivity of my, of my key, like if my keys are never going to match on the, on the inner table, then I check the bloom filter. Bloom filter says it doesn't exist. Uh, then that, that'll be super fast for me just to not have to probe the hash table. So the basic idea is this. Uh, as, I'm building, uh, as I'm scanning A in, in, the, in the build phase and building my hash table, I'm also going to build this bloom filter. And then I pass this along to B over here. So when, when it does the probe, it checks the bloom filter first. If it says it doesn't exist, then I'm done. If it says it does exist, then I actually go do the probe in the, in the, in the hash table cell. Who here knows what a bloom filter is? I always ask this every year. All right, less than half. OK, cool. So let me go explain what a bloom filter is. So bloom filters are super important data structure. You're going to see all throughout your life in computer science, not just for databases, but they're super useful in databases. So this is going to be a probabilistic data structure, which is going to be a giant bitmap that we can use to answer set membership queries. So set membership means, like, does this key exist, yes or no? And that's different from an index. Index says, does this key exist? If yes, tell me where to go find it. The filter can't tell you where it is. It just says whether it's there or not, right? And so this is going to be a probabilistic data structure, meaning it could produce uh, incorrect results with some amount of probability, a, f a false positive rate. So we'll never have false negatives. So if it says this key doesn't exist, we know that's true. It doesn't exist. But we could have false positives, meaning we ask it, does this key exist? And it says yes, but that doesn't actually do this. It doesn't actually do this. All right, so going back to my example here, if I'm trying to do, you know, I want to do a, uh, joining A and B, I would check the balloon filter and say, does, does my key exist? If it, if it says no, it doesn't exist, and therefore I'm not going to get incorrect results. If yes, it doesn't. Then I come back here and check the hash table, and it doesn't actually exist at all. And in that case, uh, you know, it, it's, it doesn't produce the incorrect results, right? Uh, but maybe I, I did a hash probe that I didn't have, actually have to do. So isn't like blue filter basically like a hash table before hash table? His statement is, is are we basically doing hashing before a hash table? Yes. Yes, but the, the hash table is huge, right, compared to the balloon filter. So the balloon filter only has two, two operations. We can do insert and, and, and lookups. So insert basically is I take a key, I'm going to run some number of hash functions on it, and then set bits in my giant bitmap based on this. Right? I'll show what it looks like in the next slide. And the lookup basically says for a given key, I, uh, for each hash function, I see whether the bits are set to 1. If yes, then I know it exists. So Again, here's a really simple example. So the term bloom filter, the guy who invented this was in the 1970s. His name's Bloom. That's why it's called this. Um, also say, too, there's other variants that can support deletes. Uh, but we can ignore that for now. For hash joins, we don't, we don't do deletes. We just want to build this thing and be done with it, right? So insert and lookup is all we need. All right, so I have eight bits in my, in my, my bloom filter. In reality, you want something, uh, something larger. Uh, and there's formulas to say, uh, if you go to this website here, Basically, function how, how many keys do I have, how much memory do I have, and it'll tell you, uh, you know, what the false positive rate will be, and it'll tell you how many hash functions you want to use. All right, so say I want to start inserting keys into this, so I want to insert RZA. So say I have two hash functions, uh, produce some output, I, uh, and I mod it by the number of bits I have, and then all I do is take those, 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 the output of this, and I fill the bit in my bitmap, right? Same thing, I insert JZA. To run the two same hash functions, mod by the number of bits I have, and I just flip the bits uh, inside the bitmap. In this case here, the first one here maps to position three, but that was already set by the RZA. Right? So you know, it's not accounting, it's not a counter, it's setting a bit. So now I do a lookup in RZA. Again, it's just the reverse of that. I take my, my key, I hash it, mod by the number of bits, and then if all the bits that the hash functions end up pointing to are set to one, then I know my key exists. Right, so th th this returns true. Then you know that you might yeah, yeah, I know my key might exist. Yes, thank you. I do a look on Rayquan the chef, 
right? So half again, I get five and three. Three is set to true or set to one. Five is not set to, set to zero, so this returns false. And I know that's correct. You know, it, it, all the bits would have to be set to true. But if I look, look up at ODB, rest in peace, uh, I get three and six. But again, that we ODB. So this will return true, and that's a false positive. So again, like I have seven hash functions. I have this, this, this bitmap of my Bloom filter. That'll sit, sit in my, it wouldn't sit in CPU cache, but it would sit in, uh, certainly sit in memory, depending on the size of it. Uh, that's way faster to do to probe on this to see whether something exists versus going to look up in the hash table. So, so this is going to go back here. So this this optimization is super common, and in practice, the I think the numbers show like you can get like a two x speed up on hash joins, because you know again depends on the selectivity of the join operator, but because you don't have to do this probe in the hash table, which could be could be huge, you have to go fetch things from disk. This is, this, this is a big win. So most modern systems do this. And the reason why it's called sideway information passing is because it sort of breaks this, this DAG architecture we talked about before where data is sent from the, 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 the children up to the parent operator in the query plan. But in this case here, we're kind of like sliding over the bloom filter to the side here. Yeah. Vertica calls this, other systems may call this. But if you think about it, you just put the bloom filter and embed it inside the hash table, then you're not doing actually sideway information passing. But the concept is the same. All right, so any questions about Bloom filters or this, this optimization? All right, so if we don't have enough memory, if we don't have a, uh, enough memory to store our entire hash table, the hash join is going to be problematic because it's random I.O. In my example I showed here, I assume the hash table fits entirely in memory. I can put a small in-memory Bloom filter in front of it, uh, and I'm avoiding that random I.O. On, on the hash table. But if it doesn't fit in memory, then that's going to be a big problem for us, right? Because we don't want to let the buffer pool to start swapping pages out uh, in sort of random order because there's no guarantee that the next thing I need will be in memory, right? I might, have, I might have just swapped it out because the hash function randomizes everything. So in this case here, when we, we want to use the same technique that we talked about at the end of last class to basically partition our data into buckets, write them out in stages, and then bring them in sequentially and do all the processing or analysis on the data we have that we bring in memory and then, then discard it and move on to the next next set of buckets. This allows us to convert, uh, again, what would have been random I.O. in a large hash table to partition it to smaller chunks and do sequential I.O. On all, all those, all those, uh, on all, all those buckets. So this technique is called partition hash join. Uh, I think the textbook and the Wikipedia might call it the grace hash join. I'll explain what, what grace comes from in a second. But we're now going to split our, uh, our hash join to, to so it's two phases again, but we're going to have a build phase where we do a pass over the, the, both the outer table and the inner table, hash it in some function, write the data onto buckets. Uh, and then the probe phase, we're going to bring all the pages within one level of, of, the, of the buckets in together, build a hash table on the outer table, and then do our regular hash join on, uh, on the inner table, do probing into it. Depending on the size of the buckets, you could just do an in-memory nested loop join, which would be super fast because you don't have to build a hash table. But I think that the textbook and the in practice, you, you, you typically build a, the hash table uh, on, on the build side. So the reason why it's called Grace Hash Join because there was this uh, very influential academic project in the 1980s called uh, Grace out of uh, University of Tokyo. And they basically built, uh, you know, they're trying to build a system that could support joins that exceeded the amount of memory. Right? And they, they came up with this particular technique. So Grace was an early example, or an example of what was called a database machine. Uh, this is a term that's not really used today, but basically, I mean, back in the 1980s, and certainly even today, the holy grail of, of database systems is people want to build specialized hardware that can do some amount of a database system, like some join operator, or some sorting operator, or some portion of the query execution in, in like custom hardware. There are systems that can do this now in GPUs, you can just FPGAs and things like that. But back in the, in the 1980s, it was like the Wild West. People were like building all sorts of crazy shit. And like, because they, at the time, like, you know, databases were super slow. So anything you could specialize in hardware could potentially make a big, big difference. So the first database machine uh, was a thing called IDM out of this company called Britton Lee. I just like this photo because it's like he's wearing a suit and tie when he works on a database, which is not how things work today. Uh, 
and this thing called IDM, they basically build custom code processors that uh, could do, I think, joins uh, or sorting pieces in the uh, in the hardware itself. Um, and then since then, again, there's just years and years and years of people trying to build these these different uh, these different appliances, or now they're called appliances, but these data machines, basically customized hardware or, or taking commodity hardware and tuning it exactly for the data system itself, maybe adding, sprinkling a little bit of uh, customization or custom ASICs to do, uh, to do some additional processing or, or FPGAs. Uh, so probably the most, the most widely used one is these Xdata things from Oracle. I mean, these things are like millions and millions of dollars. Um, Teradata is another one that they'll sell an appliance. Again, people keep doing this, right? The, the latest one is this thing called Yellow, Yellow Brick uh, that they started building out, you know, more custom hardware for, for, for databases. Uh, basically, all the database machines in the 80s failed because of Moore's Law. So by the time you built custom hardware, got it fabbed, put it out in production, you know, Intel put out the next version of x86, and any gains you got basically got, got destroyed. Um, same thing with FPGAs. Uh, like, systems have gotten faster and faster. So, like, unless you can get things on the cloud now on Amazon, people don't want your specialized stuff, right? So this one right here, Natiza, from, that IBM bought, this was, like, the early 2000s, they had FPGAs do, do filtering for data, right? And uh, IBM basically killed it because nobody wants custom hardware, right? I actually think the next decade is going to be a bit wild because of the, the limitations of x86 and, like, I don't think GPU databases are the thing. I don't think FPGAs are going to be the thing. I think some of this Risk V stuff looks super interesting because, like, you can start fabbing all, all sorts of spe specialized accelerators because there's, there's enough space on the die. That's, we can take that comment uh, offline. All right. Anyway, so again, it's either grace hash joint or partition hash joint. Same idea. So what we're going to do is the, in the first phase, we're going to scan through R, uh, take our hash function, and build out these different buckets. Uh, scan through S, same thing. See, use the same hash function, build out different buckets. Right, and then now what we want to do is do matching for the tuples that are in within the same level of the buckets, because you know again if the if the, the the assumption is that since our hash function is deterministic, meaning the same value always hash to the same same key will always hash to the same value, we know that anything we're looking at sort of at this level here can't possibly exist at lower levels because otherwise it would hash to the same thing, right? Because we assume we're doing uh, echo joins. All right, so now once we once we split everything out to these different buckets, we're going to bring in uh, the, the matching buckets together from the inner table and the outer table at the same time, and then we just do a regular hash join that we did before. So let's take the outer table buckets, build a hash table for that, and then just do a probe for all the tuples within the the inner table. Yes. So he so his comment is, uh, I'll extrapolate your comment. It may be the case that our data is highly skewed, and therefore everybody's hashing to the same bucket. So I have to do another round of partitioning. Yes, let's recursive partitioning. We'll see that in the next slide. Right. Yeah. Next slide. Right. So this assumes that the buckets, uh, if the buckets don't fit in the memory, then we have the same problem we had before, where now we build this hash table after we've already done the first round of partitioning, and now we still have random I/O. So in this case, with the way you have to handle this is that you you we do another round of partitioning to split the overflowed bucket into more buckets with an additional hash function. And you just have to make sure that the, the, the inner table and the outer table are both doing that to the same amount of recursive partitioning uh, together. Right? So let's see what it looks like. So I take my first round, I build the uh, on the on the outer relation, but I see this sort of this bucket one here. This is getting overflowed, there's a bunch of pages. So what I'll do is just take that, do a new hash function. Again, it's it's still xx hash three, just with a different seed, so that it produces different random values. I hash this again, and now I get a new set of pages or a new set of buckets for, at this level, and I maintain the existing ones. And then now, when I, when I do the, the build on the sorry, do the hashing on the, the the inner table, same hash function gets mapped out like this. But I just have to recognize that if I hash something to what would have been level one. In the first round of on the on the the build side, I just have to hash it again and end up with the additional partitioning. And I can do this recursively for as long as I want if something keeps overflowing. Again, in practice, two passes is is, is enough. Yes. So like optimistically, this fixes your issue, but like in the worst case, like all the all the tuples in just like remain there, right? 
Yeah, so, so in, in the generic case, the statement is optimistically this will work. And you, get, you, you can divide things enough to fit in memory within two passes. In the worst case scenario, everything is, is ID equals one. They hash the same thing, then this doesn't matter. And you're better falling back to, honestly, the, the nested loop join. There's nothing you can do to make this better. So your question is like, my statement is like, if 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 it's, if it's the generic case, the nest loop join, the block nest loop join is the best way to go. Your alternative is to bring in additional metadata to do what? Well, so like inter like um, when we saw like Postgres has like whatever internal record ID. Yes. Do you not just hash the record ID so that you avoid like that issue, or do you always just fall back to to something like a block like that? So his statement is, instead of hashing keys here, just hash on the record ID. And that way, I get things split up well, within, a key. within a key. But then the problem is, like, if you do that, then how do I do the probe side? Oh. Right? Because I don't know what the record. If I knew what the record ID, I would just do the join, right? So the keys have to match. Yes? Instead of being in the hashing to do the partition and change changes, do you like, partition them by the range? Like, if a key is an integer and you can just some, do some sampling and divide it into intervals? So the statement is, instead of doing like a, a hashing, which randomizes everything, could I do basically range partitioning? Yep. Could I say, you know, from 0 to 100, go to this bucket, 101 to 200, go to this bucket? Uh, there, are, there are range indexes. Uh, I... That sounds like hashing with three outputs. The statement is, that sounds like hashing with three outputs. I mean, you can build, you can build range index. Some systems support range indexes. Postgres does. DB2 and Oracle do, I think. Uh, I don't know whether they use them for joins. I know I've, seen, I know I've seen papers doing range joins, the research papers. I don't know if any real system actually does it. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good example where, like, this thing just works around with everything. Again, except, except the general case where you have small cardinality. Like, you're better off spending your time optimizing this in your system because this is going to be more common versus, like, like these little one-off things to make the range stuff work better. Yes? So, so his statement, his question is, am I assuming that every bucket fits in memory, but then if I have to make multiple buckets within one level, I just write the previous one out to disk? Yes. Yes. So, so, is, yeah, so question is, how is the data system going to decide before I start running the query that I'm not going to have to request a partitioning? They, they decide on the fly. No, but like, um, if you know beforehand you're going to have to request a partitioning, maybe it's better to do it before. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, so the statement is, if you know you're going to have to do certain, so many levels of recursive partitioning, could you make a decision that it's still better to do sort merge than, than this thing? Uh, I, I, it, 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 these are just cost estimations based on like histograms and, and sketches and other approximations, right? Again, th this is how do you say this? Estimating the, it's super hard to figure out which one was the, the, the inner versus the outer. Once the, if you're trying to base on if you're trying to do a join on data that comes from the output of another join, so you sort of have this multiplicative effect where like I get this estimation wrong and that makes this other one wrong makes the other one wrong and like after one join it, it, it all falls apart. All right, I want to quickly finish this up. Um, the partition hash join, assuming I'm enough, first, the cost is 3 plus n because it's 2 plus two, two, two passes for the one, phase, you know, one pass to read it in, one pass to write it out into buckets, Again, we, ignoring recursive partitioning. And the probing phase, I just read them back in together. Right? Going back to our example we had before, the, the same number of pages in, in our sort of our trivial example. So now if I do 3 times n plus n, now, zero point. Now we're getting hash join down to zero point four five. Again, ignoring ignoring uh, recursive partitioning. So one quick optimization I want to bring up because you might see this in the literature. Actually, if you go read Wikipedia page on uh, hash join, they'll mention this. So a hybrid hash join. The idea is that if I know my you know, my Q, my keys are skewed, they're not all one, but a lot of them are. You know, the same value. 
I'll rehash the same thing. Then basically what I do is I, I do the same grace hash join I did before, but I designate some level in, in, in the uh, buckets to be the anointed ones that stay in memory. And I just do my join very quickly on those. Right? So A, my, I'm hashing, everything's hashed to this level zero here. So what I'll do is keep, build the hash table for this guy in memory. So now when I do my probes on this, I see I'm, oh yeah, it's the special one. Let me just do the, the let me just do the probe and actually produce the output. But all these other ones could spill to disk. Right? Because sort of, again, it's a hybrid approach where you're doing the, the grace hash join where you're spilling to disk, but you're keeping this in memory. Right? So getting this to work correctly is super hard, right? Because uh, how big should this be versus how these guys? I don't know how often this is actually done. But this definitely shows up in, it's in the textbook and it shows up in a bunch of other cases. I think the high end, the commercial systems will actually do this more so than, than Postgres and MySQL. Okay? All right, just to finish up quickly, um, here's a summary of all the different join algorithms we talked about. Again, the, the, the hash join, you can see now why it's always going to be better, because in practice it's going to be just three passes through the, through the data without any recursive partitioning. All right? So hashing is almost always better than sorting for, for, for join operations, uh, actually for aggregations as well. Uh, and if, if, but if you, your data is already sorted or the output needs to be sorted, it may be the case that the sort merge join is better. And good data systems like Postgres and other systems and the commercial systems will be able to figure this out for you. Okay. All right. So next class we'll talk about how to actually more queries, and then we'll have the uh, we'll talk about project two at the the, the recitation uh, on Thursday night. Okay. Unless you want to go through this quickly. Project two, it's out. Do it. Right. Two parts. Checkpoint one. Page layout. Insert update. Right. Or sorry. You have a single key. You got to do splits. You got to do removes. You don't need to be multi-threaded for now. Checkpoint two is to actually make this multi-threaded, and you have to support an iterator that goes along range scans on the bottom. You only have to go in one direction. You can only only go in ascending order on the leaf nodes. You don't have to go in opposite direction. Makes your life a lot easier. Okay? Follow the textbook. Start with small pages. Make sure you, you latch your, your root page ID. Uh, extra credit again for the, if you go fast. Don't f down. Next class. See ya. Dang cold, stay to this toe. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's some. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake.